Hello, it's Scott Manley here. NASA operate a lot of cool aircraft. After all, that's what the first A in NASA is for, aeronautics. But among their cutting-edge X-planes is their WB-57, which is a high-altitude observation platform, which, well, has its origins that date back to well before NASA actually existed. Whenever you see footage like this showing objects re-entering the atmosphere, it's almost certainly their WB-57. During the return to flight of the Space Shuttle, one of these high-altitude aircraft was sitting 50 miles away looking sideways so that it could see the shockwaves coming off the vehicle around Max-Q. In other cases, they've been used to carry experiments up to high altitudes. They've got wing pods that they can put specialized hardware in, or they can carry experiments inside the what would be the bomb bay. Now, I'd love to say that I got up close and personal with these beasts and learned all about them, but that would require a level of organization and planning that I am unaccustomed to. However, however, while flying around California one day, as you do, I realized that I had actually come into close contact with some of its ancestors. So the three aircraft that NASA flies were built in the 1960s, but the design actually dates back to the mid-1940s. You see, the WB-57 is based on the B-57, which itself is a licensed copy of the English Electric Canberra. And one day while flight training, I taxied past these interesting looking aircraft with these really cool red, white and blue paint schemes. And of course, you know, being curious, I snapped a photo and did some research and I figured out what these were. And so I wanted to tell the story about the origins of these NASA aircraft and how these aircraft ended up in the US and what they were doing here. Look at this old school Canberra bomber. Except that it's not, it's been modified for high altitude. Actually, no, it hasn't been modified. These things were always able to do high altitude stuff, but this was modified to do high altitude photography. But yeah, this is a British built English electric Canberra. And in the late 1990s, it was bought from the UK government, it was modified, and it was flown to the US where it was owned by Air Power Incorporated, which performed high altitude missions for various customers, including NASA. I'm guessing it was probably also used for aerial mapping because I see Oracle sticker on there and a company called Terra Matrix, which sounds a lot like Terra Metrics that provides the aerial imagery that's used by a number of maps providers in the US. But for the last 15 years or so, a pair of these has been parked at an uncontrolled, untowered airfield in Northern California. So the Canberra's origins date to the 1940s. Basically, during World War II, the Mosquito Bomber has been exceptionally useful and Britain is looking to the next generation and now powered by jet engines. And the Canberra is the result. It was designed for high altitude and high speed. It didn't have any defensive armaments. It was going to rely on its ability to fly high and fast to evade any potential air defences. Powered by a pair of Rolls-Royce Avon jet engines that would generate about three tons of thrust each, the test aircraft would regularly reach 63,000 feet, but operationally its altitude was more about 50,000 feet. In the early 50s, it was setting all sorts of records. It was like the first jet-powered aircraft to cross the Atlantic. It won the last great air race, traveling from the UK to New Zealand in under 24 hours. And an experiment with a Scorpion rocket engine in the bomb bay was able to lift the aircraft over a 70,000 feet, setting an altitude record. And it came along at roughly the right time for the US, who needed a new jet-based ground attack aircraft, the design handily beat out the US competition and it was licensed to be built by the Martin Company as the B-57. In the process, they made a number of changes. The engines became Armstrong Siddeley Sapphire engines that got an extra 10% or so thrust. The Bombay doors were redesigned. It got wingtip tanks. The crew was reduced from three to two. But most interestingly, the B-57 would be much more of a ground attack aircraft. It would actually have guns on its wings so it could uh, shoot at targets on the ground instead of engaging them with, you know, bombs dropped from altitude. While it was designed to operate at altitude, those big wings it made it surprisingly agile and it was pretty good at uh, the ground attack role. The high altitude capabilities meant that both the Canberra and the B-57 were actually pretty good platforms for reconnaissance and Canberras were absolutely employed to look into Eastern Europe. 
And in the 1950s, the Canberras were used to investigate the Soviet you know, rocket facilities at Kapustin Yar and Tiurtam. And in the US, they built the RB-57, which was a reconnaissance version. But they were, of course, looking at the U-2, which would come online in the mid-1950s. It took a bit longer than they expected. So at one point, they built the RB-57D, which expanded the wings to 106 feet, 32 meters. And years after the U-2 was introduced, we got the RB-57F, which expanded the wings even further, 122 feet, and it gave it new large turbofan engines. And these are the ones which became the WB-57 that NASA uses today. These first flew in 1963, and they were officially assigned for weather reconnaissance, but it's understood that uh, one of the first things they did was fly missions in Pakistan, flying high so that they could see rockets taking off from Baikonur and collect telemetry with specialized antennas. The other useful part of weather reconnaissance is they could fly high altitude missions in the jet stream and collect particles which would come from nuclear tests. And by analyzing the particles, you could actually learn a lot about the design of the nuclear weapons which were creating them. NASA started using them in 1969, essentially to test sensors which would be later mounted on satellites. And uh, after a few years, the Air Force essentially gave up on them and NASA became the only operator of the WB-57s. NASA took on three aircraft with the rest going into storage. And uh, one of those was retired in 1982. Then 10 years ago, they decided to pull one out of mothballs and get it back into flying configuration after it pretty much been sitting around for 39 years. The Sierra Nevada Corporation handled this. It was an extensive regeneration project which required disassembling the entire aircraft, cleaning, rebuilding parts, and then finally reassembling it into a working aircraft. And I believe that this is a record for the longest a US aircraft has been put into storage and then brought back out of storage and reactivated by a government entity. So the WB-57 it has a wingspan of 122 feet, which is almost twice the 65 feet wingspan of the original Canberra. Uh, it has a pair of engines that generate almost seven tons of thrust each, as opposed to three tons of thrust from the original Avon engines. That brings its operational service ceiling up to about 60,000 feet or higher, depending upon the payload. Now you might know that NASA also has a U-2, although it's called the ER-2, Earth Resources 2, and this is capable of going to higher altitudes and you might wonder why are they still flying these much older WB-57s? And the reason is the WB-57s, they have more crew space. They can have two people on board, a pilot and somebody operating experiments. They can carry more payload. And while they can't get to the altitudes of the U-2, the W-57s are much more conventional in their takeoff and landing. You know, the U-2 has this weird tandem gear and they need people on the ground with chase cars to talk them through the landing because, because they can't see anything. These just take off uh, just like any other aircraft. Now on the other side of the Atlantic, the Canberras were retired in June of 2006. That was like a 57 years between its first flight and final flight, but there's still a couple of examples that are flying. So now the examples that I found at the airfield in California, well, this one was built in 1954 and it didn't actually enter regular service. It was used for testing all sorts of new hardware and technology. In the late 1990s, both the aircraft that are here were sold to a private buyer in 1998. They were uh, re, you know, tooled up, cleaned up, and they were flown across the Atlantic, put on display for a few years, and then the company ended up going out of business and then sold them on to another company, Air Power, who used them for various high altitude missions. And there's photos of these on in use at like NASA Ames in uh, Silicon Valley. I found a conference paper that was pitching their capabilities and they pointed out that unlike the other uh, platforms that are available to NASA, these had higher G loading so they could do turns faster. They could fly, carry more cargo to higher altitudes, move faster, operate out of general aviation airports, which in theory would make up for their deficiencies in terms of not being able to go as high as, say, the U-2. They were modified to be able to drop airborne vertical atmosphere profiling systems, where these are basically pods that you would drop out of the aircraft and they would parachute down and report uh, data back. They had a GPS system, which not only could detect the location of the aircraft, but by looking at the phase difference between the wings and the nose and the tail, they could figure out the aircraft orientation to within 0.01 degrees. 
Perhaps the most ambitious thing that they were pitching was a recreation of the altitude record using rocket assistance. In fact, one of the aircraft that's here has the same cockpit from the one which made that record. So they were going to use this to boost up to uh, you know 70,000 feet, but then... Unlike the U-2, unlike the WB-57, they suggested that they would be able to flip the entire aircraft upside down and point the sensor package at space to calibrate it against, well, space. Then, while they still had speed, they could flip the thing back over and then begin their proper mapping mission. Needless to say, this extraordinarily Kerbal mission did not in fact happen. And uh, I'm guessing the company probably either went out of business or got rid of the aircraft. And in late 2020, the two aircraft went up for auction and each of them found a buyer. One of them was bought by the Vulcan to the Sky Trust, who have you know, been trying to restore a Vulcan to flight. But they were actually interested in the cockpit, which, as I said, was the one that was part of the record-breaking flight. So they really want this aircraft for uh, you know, for the parts so that they can rebuild their Canberra. And I'm presuming that explains why it's sitting with its tail on the ground and nose up in the air. But the other one, November 3 Oscar Uniform Papa, is in much better shape and it's been bought by a private collector who wants to get it flying again. Yes, so the Canberra USA Facebook group has been posting some images and discussion about how they're trying to make it fly again. And while Sierra Nevada were able to restore a 39-year-old version, these guys are doing it on a little smaller budget. But there is something exceptionally cool about seeing the engine start on this thing. It uses a cartridge system, which is like a solid propellant gas generator. It's like a big shotgun shell without the shot. It generates this thick black smoke, but it that gas exhausts through a turbine, spins the engine up, and with the compressor running, they can start running fuel into the engine, ignite it, and get the engine running. And after repairing some uh, hardware and the hydraulic system so it wouldn't leak when they add pressure, they were able to get the aircraft to taxi under its own power. And so, yeah, I hope we get to see this thing fly at some point. I've never actually met the people working on this. It just happens to be at one of the airfields that I fly to. And every time they're there, I'm not there. It's not like uh, I pay much attention to Facebook, so I tend to miss all their postings for when things happen. I'm just mainly glad it's not going to be another one of those aircraft that's just sitting on the tarmac, rotting away to nothing. But yeah, this is just one of these things that I saw on the ground and I, I was interested, I did a bit of investigation, realized it was related to a piece of hardware that NASA operates. Not only that, was actually operated with NASA experiments at some point in the past. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>